I'm the uh, TUC national organiser. I'm already being told to lower my voice, uh, which isn't a great start. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar on trade union membership. I'm speaking to you from uh, the headquarters of the TUC, um, from Congress House, and uh, you're all. And thanks for uh, taking time out to listen in to today. What we're going to cover uh, this afternoon over the next hour is we're going to talk about the current state of trade union membership and organisation in the uh, UK. We're going to kind of cover broadly three issues. We're going to talk about the state of organisation as reflected by trade union membership, density and the state of uh, union representation. We're going to kind of zero in on young workers. Um, I'm going to give you my what I think are my top 10 challenges for the movement in building back stronger and then we've got time uh, afterwards to have a discussion and um, there's also the uh, message function where you can put messages up and ask questions and vote for the questions that I think you want uh, answered. Whenever I'm doing a discussion like this I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm a national officer at the TUC and people sometimes think well who are you? Uh, who are you to be telling us about the challenges that our movement faces? So, about you, I joined the union for the first time in um, October 1986. I was working in the Ministry of Defence in Liverpool. I concede that joining a trade union in the 80s in Liverpool wasn't a revolutionary act. In fact, it was quite common. Uh, I had the benefit of joining the workplace with 85% density, with a great branch committee and reps on every floor of um, the building. And for 14, 15 years, I was an activist and became branch secretary, trade union side chair um, in my particular branch. Then in 2000, I left and joined the TUC Organising Academy uh, as a trainee organiser. And since then, I've worked for the TUC in a number of roles. I've worked for um, NESUWT um, as a region um, organiser. And as I say, I've been in my current position for the last uh, seven or eight years. So they're kind of my credentials um, about why I think, and I'm personally very passionate about trade unions and very passionate about why we build them back stronger. So a couple of little uh, ways to participate before we get stuck in. As I said, ask questions. There's links um, below this presentation. Uh, answer the polls and please feel free to comment and chat. Um, okay, so let's get stuck in. Uh, first of all, uh, we're going to cover the state of union. So this is a, a graph. Believe me, there are scarier graphs than this. If I was to show you a graph showing uh, trade union membership between 1979 and 1997, it would look um, like trade union membership had fallen off a cliff, and that's because it did. Between 79 and 97, we lost half of our membership. Um, we went f um, and we lost uh, union density um, fell by 50%. But this is a more up-to-date graph, and as you can see, over the period of time, uh, 1995 to 2016, it's been relatively stable, but it is still in decline. We are a movement in decline. And over the last year, 2015 to 2016, we had the largest single-year fall in membership since 1995, and we lost in one year 275,000 members the bulk of which was in the public sector. Uh, after five years of consecutive growth, if you look at the um, bottom line, uh, union membership in the private sector fell by 66,000. As I said, 209,000 um, members were lost in the uh, public sector. Interestingly, 90 from um, members who were working in secondary education. Um, we're still not entirely sure what has been um, the cause of that. Uh, the number of women trade union members over the last year fell by 194,000. So it's clear that membership uh, decline amongst women in the public sector was the key fit feature of the dramatic loss in membership. And as I said, uh, private sector uh, membership fell uh, for the first time in five or six years. So that's union membership, the number of people in the workforce who are members of a union. And I suppose I should just finish off by saying we're currently around 6.2 um, million members, as you can see from the graph, three and a half in the public sector and 2.6 in the private sector. If we look at union density, that's obviously the proportion 
of workers in the economy who carry um, a union card. And as you can see, we are now below a quarter of all workers um, who are members of a trade union. Density is now 23.5%. Uh, um, this was due to the decline in union membership, but also an increase in the total number of uh, union density has fallen by more than a fifth since the year 2000. Union in the uh, union density in the public sector, which is currently 52.7%, has fallen by 6% um, in the last 10 years, and just short of 10% since 1995. And since 1995, union density has fallen by 8%. So as you can see from those two last slides, whether we measure our strength via membership or whether we measure our strength by the proportion of workers who are members of union, we are a movement, sadly, uh, in decline. So we also look at uh, union presence and bargaining coverage, which is another way of assessing union strength. Union presence is the number, the percentage of workplaces who have union members in them. They may not be recognised, uh, unions, unions recognised by the employer for collective bargaining purposes, where, they, where they've at, but they are workplaces where there are some members. Collective bargaining coverage is obviously the percentage of the workforce whose pay and conditions are negotiated um, by a trade union. So the current state for collective bargaining coverage is 26.3%. Uh, that represents a fall of 10% since 1996. In, bargain, uh, in the public sector, bargaining coverage is 59%, um, and in the private sector, it's 14.9%. Um, collective bargaining coverage in the public sector um, which is, you know, the union kind of stronghold has fallen by 10% since 2006. I suppose there's one um, other, um, I suppose, comment I should make about that is clearly, the, if you look at our strength in the public sector versus the private sector, if you actually look at where people work in the economy, then you have to flip those over. The vast majority of people in the economy work in the private sector, yet only 14% of those people um, have their terms and conditions um, negotiated by uh, a trade union. So that means that the vast majority of people have no contact with unions. Unions don't have any influence over um, their working lives. And that has all kinds of impacts, particularly uh, when we start looking at organising young workers, which we're going to cover shortly. Um, if we look at union density uh, by gender, you can see the density, despite that large fall amongst um, women, uh, women members in the public sector last year, uh, density is still higher amongst uh, women um, than it is uh, men. It's higher amongst people in full-time than it is part-time jobs, and it's higher amongst people in permanent rather than uh, temporary jobs. As you can see, density amongst those in permanent jobs is almost double the rate for workers in temporary employment and trade union membership, it's not reflected in this graph, but trade union membership among self-employed workers in 2016 increased by 30,000. So we'll look at the industries, uh, our, strength, um, our strength in individual uh, industries. I I'll let you kind of pick your way through that particular chart and find out where you work and, and the, the, the state of union uh, membership where you are. I mean, the highest density industries are uh, education with 48 percent density public administration and defense that's broadly the public sector excluding the health service uh, with their uh, 44 percent and human health and social work that is the health service and uh, and related um, sectors 39 percent the sector with the lowest was accommodation and food service activities with just two points um, five percent and a couple of other low density sectors um, are um, retail um, and we'll come back to them in a minute because once again that is very important to consider um, when we are talking about organizing young workers just to flag up a couple of things though about some of our higher density sectors um, since 1995 density has fallen in all of the high density sectors in education 
density fell by 3% over the last year, 2015 to 16, and has fallen by 6% in 2008. And in um, human health and social work, density has fallen by almost 10% since 1995. So there is attrition in membership and density, even in sectors where unions are still um, relatively strong. So we look at density by age um, amongst workers 16 to 24, less than one in 10 of those uh, workers are members of a union. Uh, goes up a little bit um, to just short of 20% amongst workers aged 25 to 34, but um, almost a third, uh, de density is almost a third amongst workers aged 50 plus. So therefore we have our highest density amongst the group of workers who have approximately less than 15 or less years left, left of their um, working lives. So we look at the age of union members, just, just an important, the, the previous slide was um, density amongst different age groups of workers. This slide is looking at union members. So the 6 million um, people in the economy who uh, carry a union card, as you can see, trade union members tend to be older than the workforce um, in general. So 40% of union members are um, age 50 and over, yet less than 30% of the all employees are in that age group. It's a similar, um, diff similar um, state of play for 35 to 46 year olds, 38% of um, union members are in that age group and just 33% of the workforce. But when we look at younger um, workers, we are underrepresented as a com in comparison with the total workforce. So whilst just 18% of union members are aged 25 to 34, almost a quarter of all employees are in that age group. And the, 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 the most stark statistic is that whereas less than one in 20 union members are aged between 16 and 24, almost 14% uh, of um, all employees are. So it's almost well, we're just one third um, in, in, in comparison um, to that. And this is a really big problem um, for reasons I'm gonna explain to you uh, over the next couple of slides. There's a big debate um, about why um, unions are managing um, to organize and recruit uh, young workers. And there's lots of discussion about about the kind of personal and political uh, views of young people and their experiences of work. But there are some very practical reasons. And the first one is shown on this slide. And it's simply that there are large numbers of young people in very, very low density sectors of the economy. So put quite simply, lots of young people work where even if they did want to join a union, there wouldn't be one there to join. So for instance, I've pulled out three or four of the sectors with the, the top four sectors where the largest number of young people work. So in manufacturing, um, 275,000 um, 16 to 24 year olds work in manufacturing. Union density in that sector is 16%, so 6 percent lower than the national density figure. And density amongst young workers in that sector is just 13.5%. So that's 4% behind the total sector density level. If we look at accommodation and food sales, so this is hotels, restaurants, fast food places, 640,000 um, young people work in that sector. Yet density in that sector, taking everybody who, work, who works in that sector, is just 2.5%. And density amongst young workers in that sector is less than 1%. So we have a massive number of young people working in a sector where hardly anybody, regardless of how old they are, is a member of a union. And then the sector in which the most young people work is retail, um, where not far off a million people, 874,000 young people work. Now density in that sector is 11.5%, so just over one in 10 of those people working in retail are members of a union. But density amongst young people in that sector lags further behind that and just 6% of young workers in that sector. Now, when we're talking about retail, 
I always get people from us door and Unite and GMB saying, well, you know, we do lots of good stuff and they do. And if we were just to take density in the big four supermarkets, then that figure in retail would be much healthier. But the fact is, is most people who work in retail don't work in the big four supermarkets. And that's why um, that figure is so challenging for unions. And just to pull out um, health and social work. So 357,000 young people work in health and social work. And as you can see, I think it's the, the second strongest sector behind education or second or third strongest sector for density of, of 40%. But if you just look at young people who work in health and social, less than 20, density amongst young people is 20% behind the total sector density level. And I guess the point I would make from that is, is that even in relatively high density sectors, we are still not organizing um, young workers to the same extent we are across the entire um, sector. So one of the um, kind of big challenges when we're talking about young workers is lots of people in the movement have said, oh, well, you know, of course, 16 to 24 year olds aren't members of a union. People join unions when they get older. And to be honest with you, I kind of thought that that might be true as well. After all, what else was there to explain why people in the 40s and 50s are much more likely to be in a union than those who are younger? But actually that isn't true and it's a bit of a being a bit of an urban myth around the movement and it's really one that we've got to kind of shake off if we're going to have a serious go um organizing young workers and this chart proves the point so i'm just going to kind of go through this so you can follow it if you read across the chart you can see that the density rate for people now aged 50 to 54 is basically the same is the rate for those aged 40 to 44 10 years ago in 2006. And that is basically the same as the rate for those aged 30 to 34 in 1996, 20 years ago. And the same applies if you take those now aged 45 49. So what we're showing is, is that these are actually just the same members moving through the kind of the age um, categories. Whilst there's some growth, this, this chart shows some evidence of some growth in the propensity to join a union during a person's late, late teens and early 20s, once a worker reaches the age of about 25, it becomes fairly fixed. Um, so each new cohort of workers is having a lower pr pr propensity to join a union than the cohort before it. And as such, the aggregate density rates fall as those cohorts move through the labor market. So in short, the reason that lots of 50 to 50, 50 plus workers now are in unions is because we had relative, we had much higher density about amongst 20 year olds 30 years ago than we do now. And the challenge for us as unions is we've got to start putting people at the beginning of that kind of union membership conveyor belt than we are now because in 10 to 15 years 20 years time maybe all of those 50 year olds who account for the bulk of trade union members at the moment disappeared out of the labor market and that's why it is a big issue we are seriously looking at density rates overall of 15 to 20 <clears> percent <throat> excuse me of 15 to 20 percent unless we start recruiting large numbers of young people into unions soon okay so that's um the state of union membership and it's um some of the challenges that we've got in organizing young workers so let's just have a little look at uh, um union reps I mean, union reps are really important, obviously. I mean, I think they represent the best of the trade union movement. They're advocates for equality. They're advocates for, for fairness. I've never seen a survey um, of union members in terms of asking them how happy they are with the, the performance of their union that isn't related to the presence of union reps where they work. By and large, you can always bet that a group of union members will be much more satisfied with their union's performance if there is an on-site uh, union representative. And apart from anything else, they are the 
trade union movement's unique selling point. It's, it's a kind of our model that workers come together, join a union, get recognition, elect representatives amongst them, themselves, who then do the negotiation and representation individually and collectively with management. It's a fantastic um, model, and it's one that's really sustained um, the movement um, you know, for you know, for for a couple of in, for over across two centuries now, but this is a model that is also under threat. Legislation like the trade union bill and attacks on facility time, and and the organisation of work, but it's a model that's under threat because we've got a demographic time bomb in terms of the age of our reps. So this chart is taken from the last two workplace employment relations surveys 2004 and 2011 and it basically just sets out a couple of the characteristics of our rep so as you can see um there was a slight um shift in 2004 and 2011 in terms of the percentage you were male 62 percent in 2004 and uh, 2011, um, we're not doing very well in becoming more diverse in that um, we're getting whiter um, in terms of our, um, uh, the ethnicity of our reps. But it's the issue of age that I think is most crucial, at least in terms of sustaining this model. So the average age of a union representative, an on-site rep, has actually increased over that period of time, 48 in 2004 and 49 in 2011. The worrying thing for me is the number of percentage of reps under 30 actually declined by 4% over that period. So did the number of reps um, aged between 30 and 39. But the proportion of rep reps increased when we looked at 40 to 49 year olds and those age 50 plus. So we have a situation where not only is the bulk of our membership going to retire in 10 to 15 years time, but so are over half of our workplace union reps. Now that is, that presents us with a massive challenge to our capacity to deliver for members in workplaces. Because if the number of reps under 30 is declining, and the number of reps actually under 39 is declining, but the number of reps age 50 plus is increasing, that means we are not backfilling reps who are getting old and retiring and leaving the workplace. And that means there is nobody to take on that reps role that we know members value. And that is a serious challenge to how we deliver uh, for workers. So just a little summary of, um, of union reps. So in 1991, the average age of a rep was 40. In 2011, it had risen to 45. In 1991, one in five activists was under 30. By 2011, just one in 10 were. And amongst senior reps, they're reps who negotiate with managers. The average age is 49. Just 1% are under 30, and as you've seen from the chart, over half are aged 50 and over. So as well as getting to grips with this massive challenge of increasing membership in density, we've also got a big problem in that we aren't recruiting enough young activists, and that is something we really need to address um, immediately. So. I spoke a little bit earlier about uh, young workers and I thought that this presentation just to kind of give a little bit of um, detail um, would be a good opportunity to sort of speak about the major project that the TUC is running with um, a number of our unions about organising Britain's young core workers. So I'm just going to sort of tell you um, how we're defining Britain's young core workers, what we've found out about them in terms of their their attitude to work and what they know about unions and kind of what we're going to be doing throughout 2017 into 2018 to try and inform the way that unions in the movement can engage with this very important uh, group of workers. So Britain's Young Core Workers, 
Um, our groups of workers are um, aged predominantly 21 to 30. They're working in the private sector. They work full or part-time. They're not in full-time education and they're earning um, low um, to average wages, in most cases, less than £10.26 um, uh, an hour. Three in 10 of them have qualifications at A-level or equivalent. Only one in four have a degree uh, compared with one third of all employees and 40% of young, young employees as a whole. 87% um, of them are working in the private sector and nearly half work in retail, health, social care, accommodation and food services. So you can see that we've kind of honed in on those sectors that I described earlier where there are high numbers of young people working in uh, very low density sectors of the economy. So that's who they are. What have we found out about them? Um, well, firstly, what we found out about them is we basically found there are three barriers to collective organization. Three barriers that are preventing them from understanding what unions do and from wanting to join a union. First of all, they have a very low expectation of work. They just feel glad to have a job. So sometimes our kind of organized agitate model doesn't work because even though they may feel some sense of grievance at work, they just feel glad to have a job. So they're not particularly bothered and they have low expectations anyway. They expected work to be rubbish. It is rubbish. There is no surprise. There is a lack of trust, yes, between them and employers, but also between them and their other kind of colleagues, whether they're fellow um, young core workers or older workers. There is not that natural sense of kind of solidarity in the, in the workplace. And thirdly, there is a sense of futility. There is a sense of, well, the way life is, this is the way work is. What is the point? They don't see any agency or organization that is available to them that they can utilize that either gives them voice or power or influence to make things better. You won't be surprised to know that there is a complete lack of knowledge of trade unions, almost genuine ignorance. It's almost as though you've opened their eyes to a completely new kind of academic subject field um, in terms of, of what they know about our movement. Most have never heard of trade unions, let alone know anything uh, about us. We're not listed in places to go. We're not seen as organizations for them. Amongst the small number of them who do know something about unions, they say they're not for people like us, the people in professions, the people in the public sector. We're too bureaucratic. They don't think we're effective. And they suspect join a union, let alone get involved and get active, there would be some um, repercussions. That said, they do have some stated needs. There are some real work-life balance issues that they face. You may have noticed the TUC recently got a campaign going about um, Britain's young parents and the challenges, the challenges that they face. But they do want some help with training and career progression. There is a desire to kind of get on in life. But for some of them, that it means just trying to get out of the job that they're currently in rather than um, staying and improving it. So what, does, what have we learned from that in terms of our approach to organizing these um, young people? Well, the first one is there's no silver bullet. Just turning up in work and asking them to join isn't going to work. Isn't these people are at such a place in terms of their experience of work, their expectations of work, and their knowledge of unions that it, it is going to be a psychological journey to address trust, the trust issues and the sense of futility um, that they feel. In short, we've got to build that trust and build some hope. It also follows that, you know, some of the the silver bullets that we've thrashed around the movement over recent years just aren't going to work. So whilst we would all agree that we would want kids in school to know more about trade unions and know how much of a part of the kind of, the, the kind of society infrastructure we are and what unions do nationally in workplaces, 
we've got to get ourselves away from this. Let's just get talking to kids in schools and they join unions. Two reasons why that won't happen. One, most of them kids, when they leave school and they end up in work, are going to be working somewhere where there isn't a union to join, even if they wanted to. And secondly, it ignores some of these kind of psychological barriers that this project is, is starting uh, to discover. As such, we've got to kind of lower our expectations and accept that it's not going to be an inspiring speech from a union officer or a union rep in front of a group of young people with a few slides of how we invented the weekend and all of that stuff that is going to convince them to sign a union membership form and get active. Really just getting them on a path to union membership where they start to open up about the issues that they're experiencing at work, start to understand the benefits of coming together collectively with colleagues and, and, and representing themselves with support. Just getting them on that path to start to think about that is the goal. So in pursuance of that over the rest of this year, we're going to be, TUC is going to be testing various prototypes of how we start to engage with young people. Um, we're going to be testing those prototypes against the ability to level, uh, to lower those barriers of um, fear and lack of hope and futility. And then the evidence we get from testing these prototypes will hopefully feed into some new model um, of engagement um, with young workers. So you'll be pleased to know, I'm going to kind of shut up in a minute, but I've just got a couple uh, more slides that I just want to share with you. Well, well one in particular, because um, we're just going to move into this. So I said, I said at the beginning, I've got uh, kind of 10 challenges um, that I think that these latest trade union membership figures um, pre present um, that we've really got to address, and, and these are them. So number one is we're dealing with a contraction in employment in sectors with relatively decent membership and density. So those sectors where union membership is relatively high and, and decent numbers of workers are in the union where there's collective bargaining, they, they, those sectors are shrinking, less people are working in them, and that's having an impact on union membership. And conversely, there's an expansion in employment in sectors with limited uh, union um, presence. There's a growth in insecure employment. And whilst people work, working in the gig economy, still uh, one in 20 of all employees, there is clearly a shift to that kind of almost completely deregulated relationship between workers and the employer. And that clearly presents massive challenges uh, for unions. Fourthly, we are not replacing members who will retire soon with young members at the start of their working lives. You know, the TUC next year will be 150 years old. And we have really got to start putting large numbers. We've got to start organizing to scale young workers to put them on that kind of union journey that the people who look, that the large bulk of members who are currently in their 50s started themselves um, 30, 35 years ago. Number five is the same goes for reps. You know, it should be really the top priority of every union in the country to look at its reps profile, work out the average age, work out how long a, a, most of it their reps in work, and really start um, to prioritise finding new workplace representatives. Because if we lose um, those reps in their 50s in 10, 15, 20 years' time, and we don't replace them with quite large numbers of younger reps, our capacity to, to deliver in workplaces is going to be seriously effective. Number six, there is clearly very little knowledge of unions amongst young workers, and we've got to address that. I'm a big fan of getting into schools. I'm a big fan of doing work in the community. But the place where young people will engage and join unions is if we're in the same workplaces where they work, and that's got to be a big priority. We've got to question the scale and the scope of current union organising activity, challenge number seven. I should have said at the beginning, none of this presentation is a criticism of anything that unions are doing. I look across the trade union movement, I see lots of fantastic work by unions, general unions, 
specialist unions, professional unions, large unions, small unions, unions in the public sector, union, unions in the private sector. Some really brilliant, innovative uh, work. Yesterday, I was with a group of reps who were organising visual effects workers in London using Kickstarter techniques. The trade union movement is no stranger to innovation. The problem is we've got to do is scale all of this up. There is lots of good and best practice in the trade union, trade union movement, but not enough of that is common practice in the trade union movement. Eight, we're all very proud of our structures, of our union rule books and our branches and our courses, but sometimes we have to ask, are they making us flexible enough to um, break out into new sectors and organize groups of workers who have much different relationships and, and terms of engagement with their employers than most of our uh, members do. And I think we, we have to look at that, and um, that includes union rule books. I mean, do we, do we too often, as officers and reps and activists, do how the rules say we should do them, rather than the rules actually reflecting how we need to organise and engage with and represent workers. Number nine is nobody in the trade union movement would argue that there should be um, a set of legal mechanisms that allow unions to um, organise workers and get recognition with employees. And, and the main way that we do that in the, in the UK is with the uh, Central Arbitration Committee, the CAC, which allows unions a statutory framework to get recognition. But there is, a, there is a limit to the usefulness of that process, particularly when we're looking at workers in the gig economy, for example, because it almost forces unions into organising small groups of workers um, when really we need to be organising to scale. And the proof of that is in 2015-16, there were just 48 applications from unions to the CAC for recognition. And the average size of a bargaining unit the group of workers that they were seeking recognition for was just 100. As I say, we lost 250,000 members almost last year. We need to organise to scale. And number 10 really is a challenge to us all, myself, my colleagues at the TUC here in Congress houses, our 150 odd thousand activists, our officer corps, um, is that can we accept that the scale of this, this challenge is such that it is beyond one individual union or any individual union to solve it themselves. That really, this is a challenge that has to be sort of grasped and shared across the movement. That actually low density in the private sector is just as much of a problem for unions in the public sector than it is for private sector workers because those quite often less favourable terms and conditions in parts of the private sector are used against the public sector. The big um, pensions disputes of previous years where the government's only argument in attacking public sector pensions was that they were better than the private sector. And the reason the public sector pensions were by and large better than in the private sector is they were won by unions. So we have to kind of get this sense that there's a whole movement response to challenges that essentially um, affect everybody in the movement. So there are the challenges, and I'll give you some of my thoughts. What should our response be? Well, there's a big question mark in front of you now. Um, and I suppose this is where we kind of um, get, uh, get into the discussion. But I'd say this, we, we have got two broad choices. One, um, we can manage decline. We can accept that maybe trade unions are a phenomenon from the 2021st century and that you know what we have we hold we do our best to preserve membership in the public sector and the, the kind of relatively skilled private sector even though and we accept that this may well be a small proportion of workers and it might restrict our ability to affect change through collective action but we can still use our financial resources that our membership will, will still give us to campaign for kind of legislative reforms and changes. Or we could go for growth. 
we can say, no, we don't accept that that decline. We don't accept that we are just a kind of historical sort of phenomenon that, you know, will come and go. That we are going to sort of plant our flag in the new world of work and say we are going to demonstrate, we know our relevance to all workers, regardless of the job they do, their skill level, their relationship with the employer, and we're going to organise them as well. But we do that knowing it's going to require us to innovate in how we campaign and organise new members. It's going to require us maybe to question and our rules and structures and the ways that we represent people. It may require us at times to do collectivism a little bit differently to the way that we do now. But most importantly, it will require us to organise to the scale that's needed because we need organising thousands and tens of thousands of workers a year if we're going to um, address these challenges. Okay, thanks for listening. That's the presentation over. I think we're going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to change screens now and we've got some uh, questions that I think I'm going to um, answer. I think we're looking to see which question has got the most vo um, votes. It could be a tie between all the votes you've got, all of the questions you've got none. Right, yeah, well, should we just do that one? Okay, so um, we've got a question here from Becky Winson. Um, not quite sure where you're from, Becky, but thanks for joining in. Um, oh, where's she gone? She's gone now. Right, uh, where's she gone? We've lost Becky's comment. So yeah, um, so it says, Carl, this is great. Good to hear TUC here researching this. Well, how willing are union officials and leaders to radically and fundamentally change union structures and finance if this is what it takes to recruit young members and save the movement? Well, I mean, you know, I, I'm not here to speak on behalf of the general secretaries of our um, affiliates and our officers. I mean, I can only say that the, the innovation project that the TUC um, are um, engaged in at the moment by a group of trade union leaders, particularly those unions who are have an um, existing organisation in those sectors, and that they are genuinely open-minded about which models we may need to develop and roll out to engage um, those workers. Um, I'm not saying that you know the trade union movement is like let a thousand flowers bloom. We we do have our kind of battles with our own kind of sort of small C conservatism across the movement. That, that's not just leaders, that's our reps and our activists. But I do genuinely think there is a, a will amongst the at the TUC on the TUC General Council through their actions in supporting this project to try and come up with something that will allow us to kind of address these challenges to the scale um, that we need. But I accept the proof will be, you know, at the end and to what extent unions, um, how highly they regard the outcomes of this project, and most importantly, if they're actually rolled out and used in, in workplaces. Okay, uh, so we've got a question um, from Anna. How do you approach new starters in your organization with a view to getting them um, to join the union? Well, you know, amongst, I mean, this is, this is a, an interesting question because I don't actually believe in unionized workplaces. Unions have that much problem with getting people who are relatively new to join the union. So for instance, if, if we've got anybody listening who's a teacher, have you got anybody listening in who works in, say, a local council office or parts of the civil service, someone who works in the fire service, someone who works on London transport or, or wherever? I think, though, because they're relatively well-organised workplaces, um, if you, someone who works in a car plant or, you know, um, British Aerospace, unions where they're well-organised in workplaces, where they've got reps, don't have that much difficulty getting people to join unions, whether it's through induction sessions, whether it's through reps walking up to them at their, at their workstation, at the desk, or, or where they perform their duties, and talking to them about the union. We, have, we do actually have a model that works. It's a reps in every part of the workplace, 
communicating with workers and particularly asking them to join and getting them involved. That model where, where it is well organized does actually work. The problem we have is we've got a declining number of reps. And as I said, in those industries where, where lots of young people work, there is nobody to ask a person um, to join a union. And, and that's why they don't join. So it's more a question of scale and capacity rather than ability, in my opinion. I'm going to say, I'm going to say uh, yeah, there's a, there's a question here from Pete about, um, about um, do we put new reps off? Um, for example, should you need to go to 100% release or effectively sacrifice your career in order to be a branch secretary or convener? Well, you know, I can only tell my own story there is that when I started in the Ministry of Defence when I was 17, the first union job I did was giving out the branch newsletter, um, you know, to around 40 people on my floor. I didn't go from that to being the branch secretary. And then I, then I became a floor rep and, I, you know, I was asked to do a range of things. I think the reason I was so fortunate in to have that kind of sort of slightly graduated, gentle introduction into movement is we were well, we were a well organized branch and we actually had different people doing all of the different functions of the, um, of the branch carrying out the different officer roles. I think the reality is in lots of workplaces that are often, um, you know, it's not uncommon for branch officers to, to have a, you know, at least two positions within the branch with its secretary, membership, secretary, organized qualities, rep, um, green rep, union learning representative and we do almost go from you know zero to hero with people and we get so excited and, and, and enthusiastic when we find someone who wants to get involved we throw we throw the kitchen sink at them i think the other issue is you know this issue about a hundred percent release i mean i you know i think there are certain circumstances where we do need our reps to be on a hundred percent release if there's a major kind of work reorganization if there's a kind of a big redundancy or, or whatever but on a day-to-day -day basis over the year, I think it, it makes reps more distant from And I think, um, you know, as is suggested by Pete, there can be implications for a person's career. You know, I think um, if you were to take the example of teaching, you know, if you're a teacher and you, you, you're on a lot of release for a long period of time, you know, you, you can almost become, de-skilled probably isn't the right word, but you understand, you'll get what I mean. Um, and I think the other issue is, is that we, we need reps who actually, who have working lives that members recognize. So I don't think we need, we need rep, we need members to think, yet it is possible to still carry out the job that I do and be a union learning and be a union representative without it requiring some kind of massive psychological or career change. I think we union representation and activity look more doable to um to kind of our members i think that's one of the reasons we sometimes struggle uh, to get people involved um and we've had the new starters one and we've i think we've covered young people um hello from cambridge uh, oh, is the, yes the webinar is being recorded jamie in uh, cambridge yes so you can watch me time and time again um i think it's on uh youtube um uh, uh, I think that's it, is it? We only had eight questions. Um, is that, is that, do we just take these questions from here, do we? Oh, and some down here as well, okay. Uh, let's have a look. Um, I'm just going to randomly scroll down and... Um, what about Jeremy Corbyn? What you might learn with the campaign? Where's that? Are you asking me that one? Or is that, is that, a, is that a real question? Yeah, Jeremy Corbyn, I mean, this, this, this um, you know, sort of Jeremy's success and the Labour Party's success in the general election um, has uh, come up, you know, in a number of um, meetings and, and, and talks I've given since the general election. And, and you know, um, it, is, it is amazing. I mean, the number of young people who signed up and joined the Labour Party and started to get active and have engaged with the Labour Party's elections and processes. And then, you know, most... Um, heartening of all the number of young people who got out and and supported the Labour Party um, at the general election. I should point out, just in case there are 
outliers from the political right watching the TUC is not affiliated um, to the Labour Party and we're a non, um, we are political but we're not party political. Um, my, my kind of analysis of the kind of young people and Jeremy Corbyn pheno phenomenon and, and particularly in the general election is, it seems very simple to me in that um, from what I've read, and this is only from what I've read, is that young people were infused by the Labour Party because they had some policies that spoke directly to the cares and concerns of young people. Um, and I think if there's a lesson for unions there, it's if we align our priorities with their priorities and their issues, but at the same time, bring union membership within reach of them and lower those barriers, then we've got a chance. I don't think deciding being infused by a political leader and then going out and voting for that party is the same process psychologically as it is to join in a union. I think we have to understand that there are issues about being in work, being seen to put your head above the parapet, maybe being a target for a kind of malign, kind of malignly intended supervisor that clearly don't exist in terms of making a decision and of who to vote for in an election when you basically go to the polling booth, it's private. But but certainly in terms of is, identifying the issues that young people care and concern about, having policies that they find attractive, and actually bringing, bringing the support, a method of supporting that within reach, there is definitely, there are definitely some lessons uh, for unions there. But I, I, I wouldn't be honest if it didn't say, I do think it's a different psychological process. So I don't think it's completely transferable. But that's not to say I don't think um, in that respect it's not being positive. Um, you got any more? What's this one? Um, Joe, a topic discussed in the thread was about how we focus the message, i.e. stop selling benefits of membership as a personal insurance policy and focus on a bigger vision, tap into people's sense of injustice. Well, I, you know, I... I would agree. I would agree with that. I mean, I think sometimes we diminish trade union membership by some of the ways that we try and sell it by um, saying, "Oh well, you know, it's the equivalent of a pint a week, you know, down the pub, um, or you know, join the union." And you know, I think one of the more bizarre ways that unions have tried to um, um, sell membership to young people is say, "Well, if you join the union, our solicitors, our solicitors will draw you up a will." Um, you know, basically to a group of people who've got nothing to leave to anybody and probably aren't thinking about dying at the time of the, uh, joining the um, union. But, you know, we have actually tried that. Um, we have actually uh, tried that tactic. Um, I, I do think we, we do have to kind of appeal broader off uh, about hope, but, uh, you know, I sound repeat myself, that um, those messages coming from the TUC's innovation project about what are the barriers to organization, low expectations, uh, lack of trust and futility. If we can come up with a message that addresses them, um, we'll, uh, we'll be in with the chance. But it, it doesn't, it, none of the, uh, lowering those barriers will not involve three pens, um, gonks that you stick on your PC screen and giving people um, a, free, uh, a, a last will and testament. Um, I can absolutely say, that won't work. Okay, right. Well, my colleague Holly here, who you, I don't think you can see, um, is giving me the thumbs up. Um, I think that means it's over rather than it's gone well. Um, thanks for your comments. Um, thanks for your questions. Um, you can um, email me at the TUC if you've got any more comments and questions. It's uh, C Roper, C R O P E R at tuc.org.uk. Please, please keep them clean and constructive. Um, I'm a very sensitive soul, um, but I will try and reply um, to the two or three I'll probably get um, after this. Um, the most important thing I would say to you, though, is for those of you who are activists and officers, is really go back to your workplaces or the workplaces that you cover in your kind of officer allocations and do an organizing health check. Look at your membership look at your density, look at your reps coverage, look at the age profile of your membership in your reps and see, in a way, test yourself of how ready for mobilization would, would, that, would that group of members be. If a big issue hit your workplace, 
how many people would you be able to mobilize into some kind of activity or action? How many young people have you got members or active in the union? Do some form of organizing health check because that alone will give you at least, I guarantee you, two or three challenges that you can spend your time addressing productively that will strengthen your union, give your workers more voice, give them more power and give them a shout at making life both in and beyond the workplace better. Just one final thing, um, next Thursday, there is going to be another of these webinars on um, a very important issue of occupational cancer. So wherever you found out about this, keep an eye out for it. And if that's something you or a colleague in your work or in your branch might find uh, useful, um, then sign up to it. Okay, thanks everybody. Goodbye from Congress House.